Welcome to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. There is a pastor named Stephen King, and he is a pastor of Bethel Evangelical Lutheran Church. And he tells a story uh, about Napoleon Bonaparte. You've ever heard that name, right? Napoleon. We all know Napoleon. Short guy. That's what I've heard. Probably my height. No. Anyway, the story that he tells is per- particularly relevant for Easter today. So I want to retell that for us. It was the year 1799, and Napoleon and his army were actually camped in the hills right outside of an Austrian village called Feldkirk. The people in the village knew that Napoleon was there to capture the town, and they were afraid. They didn't know what to expect when Napoleon and his army would come through their town. All they knew was that war was awful, and they were pretty sure it meant death and suffering. The people of the village met that night, and they agreed that such a small group of people in their town could not defend themselves against the might of Napoleon's army. So the next day, they decided that they were going to wave the white flag of truce in order to surrender to Napoleon. It just so happened that the very next day was Easter Sunday, and in spite of the impending doom that was facing Feldkirk, as the village was probably going to be overrun, despite all that, The the history of the church and the the custom of the church was that every Sunday morning on Easter Sunday morning, all the bells in every church across the entire city would ring. And so that morning, like every Easter morning, the bells rang and they rang fiercely celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And in that moment, when Napoleon heard those bells, he assumed that the villagers of Feldkirk must be celebrating the impending arrival of of the Austrian army to come help and defend them against Napoleon. So in that moment, Napoleon became fearful and he decided that he would not invade the city and he and his troops withdrew. Friends, for us, Easter is ringing these bells, declaring victory over death, declaring a new day, new life, new hope. It's like saying our enemies have been withdrawn. Our enemies have gone away from us. Satan has been defeated. Death has been conquered as well. In Jesus, we have the victory. Waving the white flag of surrender is to, is to fully embrace the new gift that comes through the life of Jesus. The bells of Easter ring out to declare death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Friends, today is a new day for us. Thank you, Jesus. So for the last few weeks, we've been going through the book of Mark, uh, and it's been quite an experience. And we're going to finish today by reading the resurrection story in the book of Mark. And I have to prepare you that that Mark's story is different than one you traditionally would hear on Easter Sunday. And you'll understand that when we read it. So friends, if you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 15, verse 42 through 16, 8. And you can find it on the screens if you don't have a Bible. I always find it helpful to just make notes if you can or, uh, you know, underline things that, that are important to you. But I'm going to read this to you again. It comes from the New International Version, uh, and I'm going to start in Mark 15, 42. Here's what Scripture says for us today. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, meaning that he was a believer in Jesus, he went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked if uh, Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could uh, anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after the sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. 
You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And here's where I want you to pay attention to scripture. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is not the traditional story that you hear on Easter Sunday morning, right? So the gospel of Mark we recognize is one of four different gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, And this one is the only one that basically stops right here on the day of resurrection with the women who come to visit him being afraid. We find ourselves this morning, uh, starting in chapter 16, in reaction mode, right? So the last moments before Easter Sunday were silence, sadness. Jesus was crucified on a cross and he he hung there all Friday afternoon. And then Saturday morning was placed in the tomb before, well, I guess it was Friday night before the Sabbath was placed in his tomb. And he sat there on Saturday all day. The tomb was silent. It was dark. People knew that Jesus was gone. His disciples were locked away in an upper room. They were afraid for their lives too. They had just seen their master, their friend murdered. And they were afraid the same was going to happen to them. The gospel of Mark is silent about what happens between the burial of Jesus and Easter morning. From the other gospels, we can piece together that the disciples were off hiding. The women were were silent. There was fear. They were locked in the upper room together. But here, the story of the gospel of Mark, the resurrection, it opens up with the women purchasing spices to go to the tomb. It's an interesting story. So we see Joseph buying spices and he's rolling away the tomb and he's placed Jesus in the tomb. And then uh, we see the women next are on their way to anoint Jesus. And did you notice how they're walking? They're walking in silence. They're walking sadly. And it says when they got to the tomb, they looked up. So we can infer that their heads were downcast, right? They had just seen one of their best friends murdered. And so, of course, they were walking slowly and, and, you know, sadly sullen to the tomb of Jesus. And when they looked up, everything was different. Their expectations were gone. On the way there, they expected to have to roll away the tombstone, but it was gone. We see that when they finally reached the tomb, they looked up almost as if they didn't want to really deal with the death of Jesus anymore until they got to the body. And when they did look up, the stone was gone. The barrier to the resurrection for them was removed. And they were able to walk right into the tomb. And when they walk in, they had to immediately reassess what was happening. So first they reacted, now they're reassessing. Where is the body of Jesus, right? Right? Friends, I will tell you, I've done a number of funerals and it is not very often you go into a funeral home or you go into a cemetery and you see bodies missing. That is not a normal thing. But these women experienced the very first time where somebody was come back from life or from death and was walking out of the tomb and gone. Instead of seeing Jesus as they expected, they see a young man sitting in a white robe and he says, wait, 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 don't be afraid. Why do you think he said that, right? Clearly those women walk into this tomb and Jesus is gone. They don't know what's going on. What do you think their faces said? Do you think they might've been saying, I'm afraid? Yeah. And the man says, don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. I know he was crucified. He was buried here, but he's not here now. He's alive. And then he gives them a specific set of instructions. He says, now go tell the disciples and who? Peter, Peter. And Peter. Why? What happened on Good Friday? We remember that in Jesus' last moments alive, before the resurrection, before the crucifixion, before all this took place, Peter denied knowing who Jesus was three times. So it was clear there was a a bit of a distinction here, right? Jesus says, or this, this young man says, go find the disciples and Peter, who is no longer considered a disciple in this moment. He's somebody else. He's named specifically. 
And then the young man says, tell them Jesus is going to meet them in Galilee like he said he would. There's some pretty big implications with this, right? Could you imagine in some of your hurt, and maybe, maybe you've had one of the worst days of your lives, and then one of your best friends, somebody you had eaten dinner with, somebody you had had drinks with, somebody who celebrated the birth of your children maybe, somebody who you constantly spent all day, every day with, maybe in your moment of hurt or sadness, they turned their back on you. Have you ever had that happen? I think at one point in our lives, most of us have had something similar happen, probably not to this extent. I don't know that I could forgive Peter like Jesus forgives Peter. In this moment, Jesus is, not Jesus, I'm sorry, the the young man is inviting Peter to come back into the group of disciples even though he's done wrong, even though he denied knowing who Jesus was even though he had backstabbed Jesus. God was inviting him to come and fully participate again. That's what's wonderful about Easter morning for us because for a long time, the history of the church was that only at Easter were people forgiven for doing dumb things. So the ancient tradition was that if you screwed up bad enough, the church would kick you out. They would say, all right, thank you for coming. We appreciate that. That's nice and all. But you guys, you're not good enough to be one of us. And so at Easter, there was hope again. They would call those who had sinned. They would call those who had made mistakes back into the church, and they would be forgiven for their sins. They based the, the, the life of the church on this moment from the book of Mark. There is hope for us, friends. Because it seems that no matter what we've done, no matter how bad we've been, we could deny Jesus and Jesus is constantly calling us back to him. The resurrection promises us hope. Isn't it just like Jesus to just invite everybody along, right? Even that friend that turned his back on him. And then we see the story of Mark take a turn that no other gospel does. Well, every other gospel kind of has this moment where um, Jesus shows up and he's there and alive and everybody sees him. And he says, here, look, you can see the nail scars in my hand. You can see where I've been stabbed. You see these? You, You recognize this? That doesn't happen in the book of Mark. Instead, we have the women experiencing this young man and they are fearful and they are trembling. And the scripture tells us that they told who? No one. They were so afraid of what they had just encountered that they said nothing about the resurrection to anyone. So much fear grips them that they couldn't even go tell the other disciples they were embarrassed. I don't know. Maybe they were shocked. I don't know what the situation was or why they felt they couldn't do the thing that they had been asked to do, but they were silent. And they left the tomb bewildered and trembling. And we know that's not the end of the Easter story, right? That's not the end of the story of the gospel because there's more to come, but that's the end of the resurrection scene in Mark. This actually then becomes the beginning of the gospel's message of sharing the word of Jesus later on. But for Mark, Fear keeps the women from telling anybody else about what they've experienced. So what do you think this scripture tells us about fear today? If we think about our lives as Christians, it's clear that sometimes we experience things that are a little bit different. Maybe some things that we can't explain. Have you ever seen somebody been miraculously healed? Have you ever heard tongues speaking? Have you ever seen things that Christians do that sometimes the world might not understand? It's clear that sometimes the things that we encounter might make us fearful to talk about those things. It might make us fearful to spread the word of Jesus outside of our doors. But the purpose of the gospel is that it is good news for the world to hear. And we cannot, as people of the cross, as people of resurrection and new life, we can't keep that message to ourselves. We can't be so afraid of what the world thinks about us or about judgment from others that we stop telling the world the good news of Jesus.
Jesus later on in the other gospels shows up. And I promise you, friends, Jesus still shows up today. Even when we're afraid that people will mock us or not believe us, like the women who visited the tomb that morning, we have hope that Jesus is alive. A hope that no matter what happens to us in our lives, no matter if we've been afflicted, if we've been outcast or left behind, if we've done something that has caused sin to reign in our lives, that there is hope that Jesus will draw us to him again. The gospel of Mark proves to us that God loves us even when we make mistakes. So how do we live in response to that? We have to live like Jesus every day. Friends, we have to be Jesus to the world. We have to be the people who show up for others when they've made mistakes, when they've fallen short. We have to be the people who show love and grace when uh, they've hurt us. We have to be the people who feed the hungry, who take care of the downtrodden. We have to be the people who speak against injustice. But most importantly, friends, we have to be people that are stronger than fear so that nothing can stand in the way of us telling the world about who Jesus is. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.